because a lot of people are thinking, you know, are we in a housing bubble? Um, where's the real estate market going to go? You know, is the market going to drop? Uh, is it going to go up? That sort of thing. And the one thing I can tell you is if you look at real estate um, over the course of, let's say, the last 40 years, you'll find that real estate is always trending upwards. There's a cycle, it always goes upwards, then there's a bit of a dip, a small correction or recession, you can call it, and then it always rebound, rebounds back upwards. Okay, well thank you everyone for attending our seminar here. Um, as you can see, I'm Carson, this is Paul. Uh, he's the mortgage broker, I'm the realtor. Uh, <clears throat> And today we have some key topics we want to talk to everyone about. Um, here's a quick agenda. We've got uh, some key factors to consider when you're buying real estate. Um, we're going to talk about a few case scenarios, uh, case studies. We're going to talk about uh, some hot locations to buy or invest in. And then it's over to the mortgage side. And so then it's over to the mortgage a side. A lot of it will be definitely more on the real estate side, but there's some fun things to learn about mortgage financing, which of course is a key part of it, isn't it? It is, exactly. Um, for questions, are we waiting till the end or should we just no, let them we'll, throw we'll them in? No, we'll be engaging. In fact, if you don't ask us questions, we're going to ask you questions to ask us questions. So please, <laughs> be engaged. We Let's take advantage of this 100%. Yeah, if you have questions, just utilize this time and just ask us as many questions as you as you guys want. So Totally. All right. Okay. Yeah. So just going to do a quick introdu introduction. My name is Carson with Remax. Um, and obviously, I'm here to talk to you guys about a couple topics on real estate. Uh now, before I go into these topics, you know, uh, in real estate, there's actually a lot of smoke and mirrors and a lot of realtors call themselves award winning realtors. And the thing is with award winning realtors, a lot of people win awards just for participating. So what does that mean to, you know, the consumer to you guys? It probably doesn't really mean anything. So. Instead of talking about awards, which I can talk about by myself and how great I am and that sort of thing, I decided I'm going to tell you guys a little bit, a bit of numbers, a bit of numbers that reflect my career in real estate. So the first number is 2011. 2011 represents the year that I started in real estate. Um, I started working with my aunt, who's actually a realtor. She's been in the real estate industry for over 30 years. And in 2012, I branched out and started working on my own. 25 to 30 is the amount of transactions I do per year, the average transactions I, I do per year. 29 is the average number of days my listings are usually on the market before they get sold. 702,000 represents the average price point of homes that I sell. 710,000 is the average price point of homes that I help my clients purchase. And 4.9 million is the most expensive home I've ever sold to date. And 220,000 is the least expensive home I've sold to date. So as you can see, there's actually quite a bit of variance between 5 million and 220,000. Now, <clears throat> what you'll find is um, a lot of realtors don't actually uh, work with lower price point clients. And my motto is, I call it my lifetime referral system. So what it is, is I treat all my clients regardless of the home purchase or selling price, regardless of the price, I treat them as my VIPs. So I give them the best service as possible. And I know that at the end of the day, they'll always come back to me. And when they have friends and family, they'll refer me to their friends and family as well. So before I get started, I just wanna do a quick survey. Can I just get a show of hands in here? Who here currently owns real estate? Okay. Half the room. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and who here would like to own real estate in the near future? Okay. And who here would like to purchase real estate to live in? Or has plans to purchase real estate to live in? Okay. And who here also has plans to purchase real estate to invest in? Perfect. So whether you buy real estate to live in or to invest in, these two things go hand in hand. The reason behind that is because when you purchase real estate, it's pretty much one of the biggest transactions you'll, you'll ever spend in your entire life. 
And so when you're purchasing real estate, you really have to be, you have to really ensure that the property that you purchase will appreciate in value. Most, most homeowners live in their home on an average of between three to five years. Three to five years is the average time before the homeowner is looking to either sell or move. And so you really want to make sure that if the home appreciates, that will actually significantly help your financial situation in the future. So, um, so one of the most important factors, or actually, sorry, there's a saying in real estate that one of the most, this is one of the most important factors to consider when you're purchasing real estate. Does anybody know what that most impact, important factor is? The key factor. Location? Location, that's right. Location location. location, location, location. That's right. Location is one of the most important factors when you're looking at real estate. And to demonstrate how important this factor is, I, I'd like to do a quick case study and show you guys what I'm talking about. So in the interest of protecting my client's privacy, I've used two cases that happened a few years ago and I've mixed up their identity and their gender just so there's some privacy there. Um, so we've got client A and client B, okay? So client A is an investor and she has a little bit of experience purchasing real estate. She actually purchased a house before meeting me, but that was back in 1997. So some time has passed since she's purchased her first investment property and a lot of things have changed in real estate since then. She gave me a budget of 400,000, okay? But she was very open to ideas or suggestions in the location that she could purchase in terms of um, finding an investment property. And client B is also an investor but he has never purchased real estate before with the exception of his own home. So he doesn't have any experience purchasing investment properties. Now he gave me a budget of 550,000 and he had a more traditional mindset. He felt that when he purchased a property, he would like to have a piece of land attached to it. So knowing that one of these investors has a bigger budget than the other, who do you think purchased the better in, uh, investment property? To clarify, when you say piece of land, obviously it's a house versus a condo. If you're in a condo, you don't own the land. Correct. If you, purchase a, if you purchase a condo or a townhouse, you don't own the land. So a house is probably, or a row house. Right. Yeah. So client A says, I'll invest in anything. B is like, I need, it has to be a house, not in a condo. Basically. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So can you guys take a guess who, pur who purchased the better investment property? B. So let's take a look at what happened. So client A ended up purchasing in downtown. Okay, she purchased a condo. Actually, it was a 482 square foot bachelor suite. And the asking price was 338,000. But at the time, the market was very hot. So she spent 365,000 because there were multiple offers. Now when she made when she bought the home, she was very worried. She was worried that she made a, made, made a mistake. She overpaid for the home. And when she got the keys, the day she got the keys, she found a tenant that was willing to rent the place for $27.50 per month furnished. Okay. Um, and she, she said it only took, it only cost about $1,000 to furnish the place because it was a bachelor suite. So there wasn't much to furnish to begin with. And if you look, if you calculate the cost of the furniture, the maintenance fee, and the property tax, the cap rate comes to 7.75%. By the way, do you guys know what cap rate is? No? Okay. So a cap rate is just a simple calculation on calculating your return on investment. All you do is you take the net operating income, you divide that by the property's asset value and you'll have a number that's expressed in the form of a percentage. And this percentage will tell you how long it takes for you to get your return on your investment. Okay. 
And typically we don't calculate the cost of mortgage because the reason behind that is because for mortgages, um, usually different investors have different amounts of down payments. Some don't even need an, uh, a mortgage. And there's also different variables involved like interest rates. So for the interest of calculating apples to apples, oranges to oranges, we don't factor in the mortgage, so the cost of the mortgage. At, looking at rent, obviously. Monthly the rent, rent divided, by divided by your fixed monthly expenses. Right. So if you have a property management company, if you have maintenance fees, monthly maintenance fees, if you have property taxes, mm -hmm. um, you add all your rent up, you add all your expenses, so you subtract your expenses from your rent, and then you take your, your net income, that will be your net income, and you divide that by the property's value. And that's how you can get an expression of approximately the rate of return. Is it divided by property or divided by the purchase price of property? Uh, divided by the property's asset value. So the purchase price today could be 300 and, uh, at that time could be 365,000, but today it could be 500,000, for example. So you would take 500,000 because that's the opportunity cost that you would have lost if you don't sell the property to use it to do something else. Hmm. So, um, so the cap rate was 7.75%. 7 the BC assessment as of 2018 was 575,000. 576,000, sorry. Okay. Now let's look at uh, client B. So client B ended up purchasing in uh, Surrey in a location called Bridgeview, which is sort of north of Surrey, very north of Surrey. He purchased a single detached home and it was a three bedroom, one bath house. It was a 950 square foot bungalow house. And the asking price was 498,000, okay. Unfortunately, the seller at the time wanted more than asking. Um, it was very common at the time for lots of homes to have multiple, multiple offers. And um, it was very common also for owners to list below what they felt was market value. And so the, my client ended up paying 513,000 for the house. Okay. After about three months of looking for tenants, he finally found tenants willing to pay 1500 per month unfurnished. Okay. So factoring your loss of rent, the three months, factoring your property taxes, his cap rate was 2.6%. And as of 2018, the assessment value was 513,000. So you see how even though the initial investment cost was lower, the rate of return was actually higher based on the location that the, the clients picked. And so that can really affect your potential value. Cause if you were to sell and you were to buy another place and upgrade, you would definitely need, you'd definitely want more, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so speaking of, so when you're looking at investments, there are basically two types of areas that you can look in. Okay. You can either look at areas that are already highly desirable, um, highly sought after such as downtown, or you can look at areas that are up and coming, new development areas that have a lot of potential for growth, okay? And how do we do that? So the first thing we need to do is we need to determine a budget. And that's why we have Paul here to help us determine a budget. Once, we determine a once we've determined a budget, we can then move on and determine based on our budget which area we can look for. And by budget, you mean that they have to get, I guess, pre-approved. So yes, exactly. You got to know how much money you're getting financed. Exactly. Right? And a lot of people don't budget or they think they have more financing than they actually do. Exactly. And then they get into trouble, which you may or may not. Have. More often than not, a lot of people do that actually. Yeah. They budget in their mind what they think is a, bu a reasonable budget, only to find out when they actually get pre approved, the budget was not to their expectations. Uh, sometimes it's it's higher than what they thought, but more often than not, it's actually lower. So it's better to pre get a pre-approved first before you go into um, looking for homes. So once we've looked into um, the budget, then we can move on and 
we can look for areas that have um, potential. So for the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about the areas that are highly desirable because probably most people already know kind of these areas. So we're just going to talk about areas that are up and coming and how to look for these areas that are up and coming. So some of you guys might already know this, but you want to look for an area that is central, have a convenient location, um, close to things like grocery stores, restaurants, banks, um, schools, community centers, parks, so on and so forth. Uh, you want to also have, um, be convenient access, have convenient access to SkyTrain transit. And it's a, it's a bonus to, to actually be closer to SkyTrain. So research, research shows that there's actually a premium as you get closer to the SkyTrain, there's actually a premium that you pay for living close to SkyTrain. And it can be as much as anywhere from $75 to $125 per square foot as you get closer to the SkyTrain. Um, that's off of SkyTrain that's already there. What about SkyTrain expansion plans? Like what, what, when is that get factored in when it's like planned? It's not yeah, so there's, there's definitely a lot of consideration for, let's say if there's plans um, in, in future SkyTrain stations. And that's actually something I might go into in, in a, a little bit deeper in, in the next slide. But first, we're just going to go into um, other things, other factors of how we can consider up and coming areas. So the other thing you may not may or may not have considered is areas that have new development or potential new development nearby. OK, so one of the things you'll find is that um, develop developers usually do they spend a lot of time researching they spend a lot of time um, discussing with the city they spend a lot of time planning they also have usually they have an in-house analyst who does a feasibility study and an, and a study to see if it's economically viable to build a project there and then they also have to do market research see if there's interest from consumers to buy or live in that area. And of course, they have to get permits from the city throughout every phase in the project. And so when all this is said and done, and they have to get uh, financing from the bank as well. So after all this is said and done, there's a lot of careful planning um, involved. And so what you'll notice is if you, a good way to see if there's a lot of potential is if you see a lot of for sale signs in a clustered area, it's probably a good sign that, um, from a lot of different developers obviously, it's probably a good sign that this is an up and, up and coming area because all those developers would have done this study by themselves and made sure that it, it is viable, made sure that with the city that it can be done, make sure uh, the market research can be done, and make sure the financing can be done, that sort of thing. So. Um, these are some examples of up and coming areas. There are probably more up and coming areas um, that I could talk about, but just for the interest of time, I'm just going to use one of these examples. So the example is Burquitlam. So this is the city of Lougheed. Okay. The city of Lougheed is a master plan community that um, the developer created with the city of Burnaby. Uh, it is a project that has 23 towers coming up okay and uh, it's gonna be a 30-year timeline so it's not a small project um, and this developer just this one developer they actually own 40 acres of land here does anybody know how much one acre of land equates to for in terms of square footage no so one acre of land equals to approximately 43,560 square feet. So they own 40 of those acres. So that's a lot of land. And their plan is basically to turn this into an urban style downtown sort of core. Um, so what you'll find is with this development, um, when new developers build a new project, they typically have prices which are a little bit lower than what the market is. The reason behind that is because a lot of developers have to test the market. They have to make sure that there is a good reaction from the, from the consumers. And so you'll find that usually the first 
beginning phases or first few towers from the developer, the prices are usually a little bit cheaper. So as a consumer, this is how you guys can have an opportunity to buy something that's a little bit more affordable. Are these the pre-sales? Pre-sales, correct, sorry. I should have, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, these are pre-sales, that's right. Um, so, so there's one caveat when you're purchasing a pre-sale. Um, and the caveat is developers actually prioritize you in different categories. Believe it or not, you may not know this, but behind the scenes, they quietly categorize you in different categories. So these are the four categories that the developer would categorize you in. The first one is friends and family of the developer. Friends and family of the developer will always get first priority, first dibs on, on the units. The second one is what I call VVIP. These are either realtors or clients or past buyers who have purchased in the project or with the developer, or they have had demonstrated a long good standing history with the developer, uh, bringing clients who are there and willing to, willing, ready, you know, to act and make a purchase. The next is what I call VIP. Um, and that's really just any real estate agent or any consumer that's just registered on the developer's website. Um, and the next one is just a regular consumer. So some of the benefits you would have as the different priorities go is as you are prioritized higher, you get number one, better service from the developer. Number two, you have a higher quality of selection of units because as you go down the priority line, the amount of availability would start to reduce as the units get sold. Um, the, sorry, I mixed it up. Quality is the next one. So quality is you get to choose things like the facing, the floor plan type, the pricing that you want. Um, the selection is, as there's more selection, there's better quality as well for the units that you can purchase. And then sometimes you also get incentives too, early buyer incentives that you may not get as, as you are down the priority line. So as we're talking about the future of real estate, uh, I just wanted to bring up some of the upcoming trends in real estate. And as you may or may not be aware, we have a very big growing population. We have uh, roughly 300,000 immigrants coming in. Um, the federal government is allowing up to 300,000 immigrants coming into our country every year. And one of the most popular cities to live in is either Vancouver or Toronto. And so you can be sure that very likely out of the 300,000, at least anywhere between a quarter to a third will be either coming to Vancouver or Toronto and the rest throughout the different provinces. Um, but just not just that, we have, a growing, we have a growing population for local residents as well. So the solution you'll find is um, the city of Vancouver recently announced that they're going to, they're going to allow 12-story wood frame buildings. Okay? Um, previously, it was only four-story or five-story. Now they're going to allow up to 12-story 12, 12 wood frame buildings. That means uh, lower cost because wood frame buildings are actually cheaper to build than, than concrete. Okay, they're also going to relax the restrictions on secondary suites. So you'll notice a lot of the new developers now will build, will actually build a secondary suite into their, into their home. So into their townhomes, into the half duplexes, into the row homes, they will actually have a secondary suite as a mortgage helper for the buyers to buy to help them fund their, well, as a mortgage helper, essentially. Mortgage helper also, like, is there a certificate on that? Uh, mortgage helper as in an independent suite that you can rent out and get rent and help pay for so your mortgage. Do you have a laneway house as well, typically? Uh, yep, a lot, of, a lot of builders will have laneway house built in and they have two suites downstairs. Even the townhouse nowadays, they might have a suite downstairs that's separate, separate entrance, separate kitchen, separate washroom, mm -hmm. separate everything, and you can rent it out to a tenant. And that will be legal from the city, not as opposed to before, which was illegal. Because? Because there's a lot of factors to consider, a um, lot of building code, a lot of restrictions that the city, and just simply a lot of pushback from, I guess, residents. They don't want as much density in their neighborhoods. Um, so you'll see more increased mixed-use buildings. 
meaning you'll start to notice that a lot of the buildings will have residential but commercial on the ground floor. And that will be the trend in the future. Um, in fact, if you look at other countries that are more advanced in real estate, for example, Asia, you will see that that's what the future will look like. Um, and you'll see increased affordable housing and increased co-op housing. So a lot of cities, uh, a lot, sorry, a lot of minis municipalities have started offering incentives to developers. And what they're doing is they're either giving them a tax break, offering them certain incentives to entice the developer to hold back a few units and designate those as an affordable housing unit. So you'll start to notice a lot of buildings will have what we call affordable housing. And some of the developers don't even build for sale anymore. They build it for rental or they even build it for co-op housing. So I just want to touch on some cool new features that I found in a lot of the new buildings these days. So this has already started quite a few a while back, but geothermal heating and cooling. Um, basically what they do is they take, they generate heat, they utilize the core of the earth and they, that's how they generate the heat or the, or the cooling. And they bring that air up, filter it and bring it into each of the units, which is actually very um, environmentally friendly, uh, energy efficient, that sort of thing. A lot of the new buildings also have packaged delivery rooms. So when you're delivering on Amazon, rather than having to, you know, you're not being home and then, you know, having to deliver to the po local post office, they'll actually have a room that, you know, you can store. Uh, and they even have rooms that are for groceries too. So, you know, like things like uh, skip, skip the dishes, spud, you know, things where you can order your groceries online. When they deliver it, they can actually drop it off at the cold storage room so that you don't have to, you know, go and pick it up at the post office. A lot of the new developers already have uh, pre-wiring for uh, EV parking, so electrical ve electric vehicle parking. Um, and some of them offer, also offer um, electric vehicles as a shared model for the buildings as well. So a lot of the municipalities are requiring the developer to provide electrical vehicles, electric vehicles to be shared by the residents in the building as well. Um, and then you'll notice a lot of this, I, I'm noticing a lot of the homes are becoming kind of what we call smart homes, where they have integrated wireless charging in their countertops, in their kitchen islands. Uh, they are, some of them are creating the um, smartphone. You can use your smartphone as a fob. So you don't even need a fob anymore. You just have your, you just have your smartphone and you can, you can buzz yourself in. Um, they have built-in Nest thermostats where you can control the heat, the temperature of your home while you're away. And um, a lot of them are even doing, they'll make sure that you have cell phone reception in your ele elevator as well um, and in your parking lot. Um, and a lot of them even have like other environmentally friendly um, things such as LED lighting with motion sensors and um, reduced water usage with their, with their taps for their kitchen and washroom as well. So market outlook. So I just want to touch really quickly about the market. As a lot of people are thinking, you know, are we in a housing bubble? Um, where's the real estate market going to go? You know, is the market going to drop? Uh, is it going to go up? That sort of thing. And the one thing I can tell you is if you look at real estate um, over the course of, let's say, the last 40 years, you'll find that real estate is always trending upwards there's a cycle it always goes upwards then there's a bit of a dip a small correction or recession you can call it and then it always rebound rebounds back upwards so um like i was saying earlier there's a lot of um there's a strong growing population uh we're taking in at least 300,000 immigrants um or immigration into canada every year and then we have a lot of political events happening globally as well so we have things like the U.S., we have things like um, the British, we have things like um, Hong Kong, you know, protests in Hong Kong. There's other, other places. I think in Delhi, there's protests there. In Chile, there's protests there. There's a lot of things going on. And believe it or not, there are a lot of Canadian residents who live in these countries, and they are now looking to come back to Vancouver as well. So on top of the 
immigration, you have people who already have Canadian citizenship who are thinking of coming back. And just as a showcase of um, real estate in terms of affordability compared to other parts of the world, this is a quick chart of what real estate prices look like in other parts of the world. So you notice in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is one of the most expensive real estate um, places in the world. Um, when my aunt was here, uh, I have an aunt on my father's side who lives in Hong Kong. When she came here a couple of years ago, she told me that parking spots in Hong Kong cost upwards of close to 500000 for a parking spot. So um, as you can see, you know, she told me that there was, uh, there was a new pre-sale that was coming out in Hong Kong in the, I guess, poor or were low, you know, not so, um, I guess, the poor, cheaper side of, of, of Hong Kong. And people were lining up to buy the pre-sale. And you, you don't get it, and you don't, even though you line up, you don't get a chance for sure to buy. It's just a raffle. You're lining up to get a raffle to buy the home. The home was roughly, I think, two to 300 square foot. And the cost was roughly about 11, 10 to $11 million Hong Kong, Hong Kong dollar. So if you equate that to Canadian, it's, I think, roughly five. You divide it by five. So we're talking about roughly $2 million, US, uh, $2 million Canadian just to buy a two to 300 square foot condo. So imagine for those people coming here to buy a home that's $2 million, they're buying a castle. They're buying a mansion. That's nothing for them. They buy, they sell their condo and they've got money right away. They can, they can easily buy a condo here. They can easily buy, you know, um, a townhouse. So if you, if you look at us in terms of affordability, we are actually not the most expensive. Um, and I think, that kind of goes to say, you know, that's what the future is going to look like, unfortunately. And you'll, you'll start to see also more and more condos and townhouses as we have a very limited amount of land. And that's pretty much the end of my presentation. Now I'm going to turn it over to Paul, talk a little bit about mortgages. Big shoes to fill. I'll take this down. That's great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so now we're all pumped to buy real estate. Now we need some money, right? So let's talk about uh, the financing side. Uh, quick intro on my end. Uh, I come from the entrepreneurial world and uh, landed in, uh, I guess, the mortgage world fairly recently. Uh, yeah, our agency has, uh, we, we like to innovate a lot and we have our the agency side and we also have what we call our sandbox where we build products and services around things we learn from our customers. Uh, the mortgage industry was, is something that sounds really random to pair with a, like a, a marketing background, right? But what we saw from the, uh, the mortgage industry is that there's such a lack of education in how to properly look at financing a home. There's so many rules that have come up recently. There's so many misconceptions around financing. And I also feel like we're really passionate about people leveling up, really. Like at the end of the day, when you're going to buy a home, you've got to know, of course, where you're going. And, but it's also about preparing to buy that home, right? And it, it's all about how well you manage your money. So really personal finance is a huge thing that we've seen is uh, I think still up and coming, not really taught in schools at all, which kills me. It really does. It's just practical information. So anyways, uh, building level up mortgages, we're really passionate about uh, helping people really think about their finances, think about their finance strategies so they can level up and of course have a home and uh, you know start to build their life, right? Either for their family and or as investment properties. So Carson, I think covered really well. So I'm very excited to uh, talk about some of the things that I've learned in the trenches. Uh, before I kind of walk you through all the slides, we're going to have play a bit, a bit of a game. We're going to select which topics we want to most learn about, and I'll do a bit of a deep dive on those. So the first one actually is uh, learning about the first time home buyer's incentive, which is basically high level. The, the government pays a part of your down payment, which means that you therefore pay less on your mortgage. It's a very recent incentive that they just re-amended just last September, so September 2019. And the next thing is around credit score, right? So what affects your credit score? Uh, what credit score do you need to have to be able to qualify for the best mortgage rates? So what, what affects this very sort of, you know, hidden, ambiguous credit score, okay? So we've got two topics, the first time buyer incentive, and we have the, the credit score. Which of these uh, are you more interested in? Should we 
Raise, raise your hands. Raise your hands for uh, first time home buyers incentive program. Having the government help you pay your down payment. One, credit score. Okay, it looks like there's uh, enough people here who have gotten burned by a credit score and they don't know how the heck that worked out. And I'm, I'm with you on that because it is a total beast. So what I will say about this incentive program, and I'm gonna like skim over it, is again, there's a new program as you, see, as you can see through the slides. September 2nd is when it got re-amended and basically really high level. Um, there's about four different incentives around it. Uh, only first time home buyers, of course, this is what the incentive program is for. Uh, you've got to put down at least 5% and usually the government's going to match that. It's a maximum of 10% and 10% is only if, you, if it's in your home. If it's an existing home, 5% is the maximum. So what that does obviously is that then therefore you pay, you have less of a mortgage and you pay less monthly payments. Now the catch is you've got to pay it back, right? You've got to pay it back either when you sell your home, which Carson was saying, some people sell homes in three to five years. That's crazy. That's like, very quick, right? So it's going to be then or it's going to be uh, in 25 years if you hold it that long. Now, uh, a big part of the catch, be, before I get to the big catch, is uh, basically your home can't be over, over half a million dollars because they say uh, your household income must be under 100, 120K and uh, the mortgage amount that you get, plus of course the government's contribution in the program, cannot exceed four times your income. So it's about 500,000, which if you live in Vancouver or Toronto, it becomes more and more challenging, right? So there's been a lot of complaints around, well, hey, like I, I, that's not doable to buy a home here or a condo. That's where people I think have a lot of beef with it. But even if you do have the budget for it, think about the appreciation uh, that happens between now and five years and now and 25 years. So you've got two levers, right? It's the appreciation of your home and then you've got um, basically how much you're saving on your down payment. Right? Because yes, you have to pay the government back their equity in your home. Right? So if you appreciate, if you wait 25 years and you look at 3% appreciation a year, the math works out that it's going to be probably about 20% higher than, yeah, than the amount of money you save in your down payment with the program. So it's kind of like going on Dragon's Den and you know, you give them equity in your, in your house and you have to really gauge uh, where that's all going to go. Most people don't like that. They don't want to give the government part of their upside. So, uh, sorry to interrupt. So, you yeah. have to pay back the equity amount that that's that they invested into, not the amount that they lend you. Correct. So, oh, okay. So, so, so it appreciates the exactly. So they oh. th they're part of your upside. Oh, okay. Now, if it goes the other direction, if there's a you know a crash, of course they share the risk. But most of us know that real estate generally goes up, and depending on where you buy, it'll probably go up a significant amount, right? Given the trend. Mm -hmm. So. Um, if you really can't afford the monthly mortgage payments, this could be good for you. But obviously, if you if you can, then I I, I would suggest to stick to your, uh, keeping your equity. But again, it's, it's incentive for different people, and just something to keep in mind before you just jump in and, and join the program. So uh, yeah, those those are the main kind of triggers. Now the deep dive around credit score that I want to do is going to be surrounded by a story, of course, and we're going to go over just the high level facts. So. Um, I was going to play a game and ask you guys what the five factors are, but I guess they're already there. So we're going to go through them. Uh, well, I mean, I think most people understand the first one, right? Payment history. Do you pay on time? Right? And a lot of people miss them because they forget to set up automated pre-authorized payments, right? For credit cards, which is a game saver, especially if you have more than one card, right? So that's something that most banks can do. So definitely make sure that you have a pre-auth uh, payment on your credit card statement. Uh, credit utilization. That's actually a little bit ambiguous in its name. Who knows what that means? How much credit you're using, like how many credit Co cards you have. Correct. Credits right, but then it's how much credit do you have per credit card and how much debt are you taking on per, uh, I guess, financial vehicle. So a lot of, a lot of us start with like a $10,000 uh, credit limit. If you're spending, if you owe more than $4,000 on that, that affects your credit score. If you see like a, a, pen, a rolling amount, if even 5,000, you pay it back on time, Still, you're using a lot, a lot more credit than they think is responsible. So ideally, yes, if you're spending more than 4,000 a month on certain things, have multiple credit cards, spread it out. Which actually ties into uh, the bottom one down here is actually, they like to see you have multiple credit sources. So if you have multiple credit cards, and if you have you know, a line of credit and different things, as long as you paid on time, that's great because they're like, holy crap, Santiago pays everything on time and he is pretty good at taking on debt. So they want to see that mix and not just credit cards, lines of credit, 
you know, there's certain uh, uh, mortgages are for the different vehicles there that um, show your track record of paying back. So it's actually it's not bad to have a lot of uh, different, you know, assets, but you got to pay it back. Yep. What if you have a lot of different credit cards or uh, credit lines or that sort of thing? Yeah. But you only just use mainly one card and the rest you just keep as a zero balance. Would that help or would that be negative or does it really matter? It won't be a negative. It won't do much. Um, I mean, the fact that you've got approved for those, I could yeah. see it helping you. I don't see it hurting you, right? right? But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't do much if you're not actually using it, oh, but it could have as an option, oh, right? As long as you're paying those annual fees, you're not forgetting about those, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> I've got a story about literally I owed a dollar on one of the cards and I didn't know, I, was, I thought it, it was a no fee, uh, no annual fee, and that affected my credit score, one dollar. And, I've, and I'll tell you in the next story, which is what well, we the big story of how that all was really uh, surprising. So the, the other two are age of credit history, so related to the mix of credit cards that you have. If you've had a credit card for 20 years and you're paying them on time, versus if you just got a credit card yesterday, guess what? You know, guess what the lender is going to value more? Well, 20 years. You you have a track record. The whole thing is track record. Um, Does that mean that your credit will fluctuate a lot more when you are Mm -hmm. and um, you know you, one of these factors changes mm -hmm. will, that, will that affect so for example if someone who has a, a credit history of 20 years versus right. someone with a credit history of like 3 years mm -hmm. their, credit, their credit score the person who has 3 years will be a lot more fluctuating versus the person mm -hmm. who has 20 years of credit you would think so I don't know the official answer to that because they don't they reveal certain things about how credit score works I haven't seen that scenario but you would think if there's more data points to work off of, then an incremental change of a lot of data points is less of an impact than if it was in a smaller amount of time, i.e. the you know the three years. But uh, that's something I'll have to off the research to actually and get back to you on. Good question. Uh, and the last thing for is credit inquiries. So I made the mistake of uh, well, it wasn't really a mistake. I uh, I like to do travel hacking. Has anyone done that? Where you you get a bunch of different credit cards and they they give you travel points. Right, and then you can travel, and then you cancel the credit card, and you have the points, but you've got to spend X amount. And anyways, uh, I was doing that, but like at a certain point, I was applying to so many credit cards that so many of them were actually pinging uh, my, you know, my Equifax, and uh, they're asking, well, like, what's this ball guy doing with all these credit cards? So I had a lot of cards, and again, some of them that got approved had annual fees I didn't consider. So I was getting ding with the, the credit score, right? Because of these like marginal fees and there's a lot of inquiries happening at the same time. If it's happening in a short amount of time, that's a bit more concerning because the inference is what? This person is desperate for, uh, for getting credit cards and obviously if they're applying to a lot of different spots, they're probably getting rejected, right? So there's a lot of presumptuous things that kind of have merit to them that the government thinks about. So you gotta be careful about that. So yeah, those are kind of the five uh, things that affect credit score that you wouldn't always think about. Any other thoughts or questions on that? Ready for the story? Okay, cool. So this story, hold on. Oh, I like was that your, your battery? Hopefully not. So again, this is actually the breakdown, by the way, on the, the categories we talked about. So of course, there's more of a, a weight on paying on time, basically. And this is the big one, though. Do not abuse your cards, even though if you're paying it on time, you don't want to go over, over that 40%. So, the, sorry. So it's over the forty percent is the threshold of what you don't want to spend more of. Right. If you if you mess it up, thirty percent of what affects your credit score is is over here. Oh. So yeah, they're different numbers. But forty percent oh, is like okay. don't go over that. And if you f that up, then it's going to affect a third of your credit score basically. Third, oh, third is based off of credit utilization. Correct. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So these these are, these are the levers of if, of what affects uh, your credit score. So, you know, if your age of credit history isn't that great, to your point, Santiago, right, between three years or 20 years, it's quite marginal to, like, you not paying on time or you spending too much. Does that make sense? So this story, check this out. Uh, of course, this is uh, one of my favorite movies, Jerry Maguire. So there's something called creditor notes. And I found out about creditor notes when I, I, was, uh, I was looking to improve my, my credit score by I was ordering a, um, a Amazon pre-purchase cash card a Visa card, which is a different kind of credit card. It's like, you know, any of the credit cards you get at certain retailers, right? It's a different kind of credit card, so it helps your credit score because it's, it's part of your credit mix. So I was applying, I think my credit score was over 700, and by the way, if you're below 600, that's when banks start saying, at least the prime lenders of the best rates, they start saying, nah, we can't, we, we can't do this. But I was well above that, and I got a rejection letter for this 
it was like a student Amazon card. I'm like, how could I go out and turn down if I've got a credit score above 700 and I've got approved for much bigger credit cards, like what's going on? And that's where I learned about credit notes where again, if you have any cards that you haven't canceled yet, right? Uh, and, um, and that you have overdue payments on from the past, if they're 30 days overdue, 60, 90, right? Even if it's $1. They, uh, your banks or the, of course, the uh, the credit card companies, they'll talk to TransUnion, they'll talk to Equifax, and there's these creditor notes that say Paul was not responsible in paying a dollar for 30 days, 60 days, and 90 days. So you should really keep that in mind, even if his credit score is great. So then I was like, that's kind of BS, right? Because it's a dollar, and it, I mean, you know, I didn't even know it was there. So I had to call the credit card companies to, you know, rescind their uh, their initial complaint. And, uh, and it was a whole ordeal, right? And I guess ways to avoid that is and like really be conscious about how many credit cards you have and really what the balances are. And again, the more cards you have to help your credit score, it's a double-edged sword because if you don't manage them well, then you get these creditor notes, which take six years to delete unless you're proactive in getting them deleted through the original, I guess, person who filed the complaint. So that, I, I, as you can probably imagine, if you look at the photo now, that was me on the phone uh, Monday morning for a couple hours. That's probably actually worse than that. I was, I was furious. But anyways, figured it out, and, and you know, hopefully it's to your benefit of you know not making those mistakes. But really, it's just kind of this. I'm glad we voted on that category because it's very much this black box that I think needs to be more transparently talked about. But yes, question. Yeah, so I found it out the hard way. Uh, what you can do is you can call TransUnion or Equifax and ask if there's any notes on there. Yeah, again, my, my, I, had, I didn't know about these notes, so I'm like, why is there a problem? I've got a good credit score, I don't get it. So, but yeah, I'd say give them a call and that they're fairly responsive and they will tell you who followed the note and what it was. So yeah, try that out. Yeah. So Credit Karma, Borrow Well are the big ones, especially in Canada, and um, they're fairly accurate. I recently did a, a test where I, I looked at Borrow Well, which is just this very, I mean, it's a very seamless way to check your credit score. It's a really nice interface. It's a lot nicer than the stuff you'll see on Equifax and TransUnion, at least at the day of this recording. I think they're improving that. Uh, but then, of course, they, they, they say, oh, your credit score is this. You should take on this debt. So you got to be careful about the things they sell you. But it's a very seamless way to do it. It's free. So it's actually free on TransUnion and Equifax, but at least from my opinion, it's still extremely cluttered and archaic. So you may prefer the, the interface on Borowell and Credit Karma. But to your question, they're about like, mine was within 20 points difference. So like a 720 versus a 740. It's pretty similar. When you do apply for a mortgage, of course, we will do a, an official credit poll, and that's gonna be super accurate. It's, it's a lot more granular. Uh, but yeah, it's it's fairly similar. So I, th I think just keeping a tab on that is great for now, especially if you're not like immediately buying. So I know in the past that before when you would look at your credit score, that that would affect your credit, your credit score. If what, sorry, if? In the past, like before Credit Karma yep. and, and, and the other one, that looking at your credit score would affect your credit score. So that's generally a myth. Uh, there's, there's something called a soft pull and a hard pull, right? So that would be a soft pull. Right, even certain like you know employers and whatnot, like that can be a soft pull, meaning that they're pulling your credit score. It's soft, that it doesn't affect your score. The hard pulls are more like if it's credit cards or potentially mortgages, right? Those are much bigger ones. But there's a whole, there's a whole table around like what affects and what doesn't. It's not everything, and especially if you're on those on those platforms, I, I hope <laughs> it's a soft pull. I mean that's a whole business model, right? But yeah, pretty interesting stuff. Great question. Um, okay, switching gears to a bit of a scenario, so. Um, there's a couple ways to look at mortgages now. So we're going to go off, uh, you know, the proverbial half million dollar condo, maybe not in Vancouver, Toronto, but you know, you got a half million dollar place you want to, you want to purchase. And, um, usually what you'll see is there's a pretty big difference in the rates depending on the amortization period. So amortization is how long you have to pay back the loan, right? So actually this is a question of what's best for you. Let's, let's give it maybe 10 seconds of you know, looking at this and thinking about some of your financial goals, let's say. And does anyone want to take a stab at which of these is best for them and why? Before we get into all the math. Just off your gut, what do you think is, is better for you? 
OK, lower rate. Super logical. OK. Now, if you have a lot of credit card debt that you keep rolling forward, let's say, and you're getting charged 20% interest on the credit card debt, right? And money that goes towards the mortgage now cannot pay off credit card debt. You're bleeding interest rate, right? And, what it, and if we look at the math, so I'm, ha I'm sure most of us were going to go with the first option, right? Um, if you do a bit of the math, uh, there's actually, you're actually playing, you have, of course, even though the rate is lower, you're paying more per month. Why? Because it's a shorter time period, 25 years. So if you do a bit of the math, you see there's a $128 difference. If you went for the other option, 2.79, but a longer period, you'll see that uh, you're actually paying $128 less. I mean, it's deferred, of course, because overall you'll see there's a lot more interest you pay in the long run. But if in the short term you've got a lot of debt, you're better, you arguably, you've got to you know, put it to a spreadsheet and talk to your accountant, arguably you're better off what's going to be over 25 years, that's $38,000 of deferred, but basically money you can save and put into paying off your credit cards, which therefore omits all the interest that you're going to be charged for the 25 years, which could actually be, be a lot closer to you it being worth your while, right? If you do the 30 year and you're very good at saving those $128 every month to ensure that you're consolidating debt, you're paying it off and you're, you're omitting those interest charges. So that's for some people, right? But look, overall, if you can pay your mortgage off faster and at a lower rate, do it, right? I think that's the answer that I think usually will work. But again, depending on your scenario, it's not a no-brainer. And that's the thing about rates. It's not just about the rates, it's about the amortization period. It's if you move cities and you have to break your mortgage, which is two out of three people break their mortgages. I mean, the, the, prepay, the, <laughs> the penalties to that could be quite a bit, like in the tens of thousands of dollars. So when you're looking at mortgage products, Look at the different layers of it and the different scenarios, and you have to tie that to your short-term or long-term financial goals, which is why this goes back to personal finance 101, right? Which is something, again, we don't get taught in school, and it's pretty boring to just study yourself until it's too late to some degree. So that's where I hope to kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> show you some, uh, some battle wounds and some stories that, you know, hopefully you can learn from firsthand versus you having to be the protagonist in these, uh, in these stories. Uh, but yeah, that's a bit of a, around the rates there. Um, one thing around transfers. So uh, I did a YouTube video on this, so you guys can look at that for the full sort of scenario. But uh, who is, who's got a mortgage coming up for renewal soon? Well, eventually you're gonna have it coming up for renewal, right? So at that point, you save the bank or do you go somewhere else? So this, in, in a nutshell, it costs very little to do a transfer, and that's if you're taking your mortgage from like lender A to lender B. Right? There's very few legal fees, unless you're breaking it, of course, that's a different story. But yeah, basically you want to look at the, the interest rate differential between those two. So uh, in this case, it's 0 0.31. And you know, if you were to, if you were to look at, this is actually stats from five years ago. So if you were coming for renewal, let's say this year, 2.6 was the average you saw on the market at the, in December of, I guess it was uh, 2014. We, we were as low as 2.29 last month. Right, so 0 0.31, that technically, if you were coming for renewal right now, you'd see that there's, or I guess five years ago, staying at, staying at 2.6 for this 2.29, 0 0.31. You do the math and you just, you times that over the 60 months, which will be the five years, you can save about $7,000. Right, not bad, 7,000, I mean, what can you do with $7,000? Trip, Tony Robbins seminar, you know, buy a bunch of awesome healthy food for the next little while and you know like you know get some organic food and all the things that are just a little bit more expensive than the stuff you might usually buy like there's a lot of stuff you can do with that or invest into an index fund put it towards a down payment i mean seven thousand is it's it's not nothing right so i think the mentality that i want to you know hopefully convey today is it's all about looking at ways to analyze things not be so automatic about being like oh lower rate let's do that and like just taking a bit of time to do the math, or of course, talk to someone who can do it for you, your mortgage broker, your accountant, maybe even your realtor. And like, if you do these over time, you're gonna be just, you know, a lot more further ahead by being a bit more, you know, uh, inquisitive about, you know, these numbers and the ways you see, um, you know, financial products, um, I guess, portrayed to you. So here's a bit of the math, right? If you save about just over $7,000, that's a mortgage calculator that shows the interest, you know, across the, uh, the 60 month time span. So yeah, pretty interesting. Uh, it's always fun to crunch numbers, <laughs> and especially if you've got a nice calculator to do it for you. Um, last thing around, um, I guess, looking at a new mortgage term. So there's also refinancing, which is different from a transfer, right? Usually you have a refinance, you're pulling out equity. So again, same scenario. If you want to pay off debt, you can do that by, you know, 
uh, going to another lender that gives you perhaps a, you know, a bit more equity to play with or a better rate. And you can pull out um, equity towards paying off your credit cards. So it's like you're getting another mortgage plus you're getting cash. And, some of the, and they've got different, uh, you know, different rules around how much cash you can pull out. Sometimes with a collateral mortgage, they give you more cash. They actually value your house to be you know, 125% worth of your value right now. So you can pull out 25% more actual equity on top of the house value. There's interesting things you can do there. Um, but the point is that if you want to be liquid and you, you really need money for renovation or paying off debt, uh, those are all things you want to inquire on as you get a new mortgage somewhere. Or if you refinance at the current place, you need to make sure that, it, it, that they're, um, they're flexible on the terms of giving you liquidity, right? In terms of how they give you money. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot more cost for refinance versus a transfer. Transfers are really like fairly easy, right? Uh, but refinance is a, gives it a bit more um, more things to consider, and that's again, you want to talk to someone who knows how to do that, and then you guys can you know work it out. But but yeah, refinances are definitely something that I see a lot more of. Um, and speaking of, of saving money, I mean, at the end of the day, we just want to we want to save money. We want to live well and save money, right? So here's a really cool program, uh, of course, which rewards you for being uh, conscious of the environment. Uh, yeah, 25% refund on your mortgage insurance. So remember, if you pay over 20%, if you pay sorry, under 20% down payment to the more, to the house value, you're forced to um, to pay for mortgage insurance. And that it's done through Genworth, which is the, the main one that's providing this specific benefit, and C, you know, CMHC, and uh, what's the last one? Uh, Canada Guarantee, right? So they, they all have specific programs where they might even give you some, again, a refund off your insurance if it's a house that they say uh, is environmentally friendly. So there's a whole checklist you can see online around uh, how the house is built, even a renovation actually. Sometimes they can actually give you money back if it's done, if it fits their code on being, you know, sustainable sustainable, and, and, and fitting their kind of rubric on what is a, a, a green way of, you know, renovating your place. So I thought it was really interesting. Things to look at, right? Uh, it's cool to see these uh, big corporations, these big beasts uh, be flexible there. Um, and just a note on uh, the future of living. So um, on the financing side, I found that a place called Key Living. It's a startup out of Toronto. A friend of mine actually runs it, Daniel. And they call it Living as a Service. Their whole vision is that if you're paying rent and you can't afford a house, you can't afford the mortgage, but you hate not getting some kind of equity, what they say to you is, hey, if you put in $25,000 as a deposit uh, with us, uh, you can have access to our properties, which are premium properties uh, across the world. This is, of course, the intention of it. And you will get slightly below market rent. And the $25,000 goes into our endowment or into our company, which appreciates around the same of what real estate appreciates in general. So it's like you have, it's like your down payment, which grows with the market, and it gives you access towards uh, their network of, um, of houses right, in different big cities. So if you're an expat or you don't know if you're gonna be somewhere for long or you just want just better rent in a premium place, that's a bit of their model. So it's kind of, you know, giving consumers the, I guess the illusion of equity, which to some degree it is, and they're giving you fl ultimate flexibility, which I think is really interesting. So they're about to launch that, which is really cool. That's it, mainly out of Toronto. Uh, single key is more for, um, I guess, all these key branded uh, startups. It's quite the quite the word to use. I guess it makes sense, right? Um, they talk about insurance for landlords. So a lot of so, so for the investors in the crowd, you know, if you have a lot of doors, and yes, there's a property manager, of course, but then there's also screening tenants, collecting rent, etc. They basically give you insurance for your rent. So you pay X percent of the rent is of course their fee, but it's insurance. So if someone doesn't pay, they give you they pay they cover it for you. So yeah, yep, question? What's the requirement for that insurance? Like, is there some sort of requirement that the landlord or the tenant has to fill a prerequisite before they're willing to insure that, or just any? So I, I think the property is that, that there is some specificity to it, but from what I've seen, and again, I, I'm not you know the founder, but I can connect you with them, no problem. Um, generally speaking, it's, it's pretty like, it's pretty open. As long as you're paying 5% of the rent, to them as a fee a month, oh, okay. yeah, that, that's how they, that's how they charge. They've got enough backing to just make that worthwhile for them. Oh, okay. But the thing is, they screen the tenants for you, which is a, which is a value to oh, you, better, yeah. right? And of course, they have a vested interest in screening the tenants yeah. for obvious reasons. Yeah. So there's a line incentive. So I thought that was really cool. That's more for the investors. And who knows about We Live? As you may have imagined, they are part of their um, embarrassing older 
older brother of WeWork. Uh, <laughs> and they're off the concept that uh, if you are um, looking for, again, a premium living experience and you're living in very high density areas that are very expensive, like San Francisco, New York, right? Maybe Hong Kong. Um, they, it's basically an apartment they rent out and they split it up between different people. So, so they really, it's really nicely designed. Uh, it, you can pay it for a few days or you can pay it for a few months. And it, it, it's basically a short-term lease and you can get access quickly and make friends. Big thing is that they, they're pushing community, which is a big, a big thing we didn't talk about a lot, a lot about today, but isolation is big now, especially in like, you know, larger cities, people don't really interact as much. Um, that's based off just the mentality of the cities. It's based off the way some of the buildings are built. Not a, not a lot of room for community, and it's something that you know it's a bit of a problem, especially the, you know the, the era of social media, right? As they say. So yeah, some really cool startups that are talking. About, you see the trends here around making people feel more like owners and giving them more. It's all about flexibility. I think that's the key. Flexibility, uh, insurance, being able to be a bit more risky or having someone really like have a turnkey solution for you, and again, community is a really big thing as well that I think is super important, right? Uh, you know, you're at home fairly often, right? So I think that's a huge part of people cross-pollinating and learning from each other and feeling like they're they're part of one. So let's see if this video works here. This is actually um, a place called Bumblebee, uh, not to be confused with Bumble. Uh, it's a, a place that literally takes, like, I think it's like 200 square foot place. And it's kind of like, a mur it's everything's Murphy'd out, like Murphy bed, Murphy cupboard. Let's see if this video works, but it's really interesting how they make use of space. Oh, hold on, let's see if this works. We'll at least get the visual. So the bed goes up. The board games come down. <laughs> so there's a lot of tech behind it, I guess. But yeah, it's pretty neat how they uh, make use of very small space, which naturally happens as, as uh, the city densifies and as uh, things get more expensive. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, they, yeah. they actually do the renovations or they they, they, they design it space? they design oh, it they design it yeah i'm pretty sure they design it okay so yeah. if you buy a place and you have a, don't have a lot of space you can hire them to help you design it like that so i'm not sure about that i know i think they design the places that they saw i think i think they're part of the development process oh, now okay. they do it for existing properties i have to check that oh okay okay, okay. Um, but yeah i mean definitely worth looking into but the general concept of like making use of, of small space I think is, is quite genius I think more and more people are, are okay with being minimalist and there's a whole movement around that which I think is really interesting so yeah future living especially in the very expensive cities there's some solutions around that that I think do have a I think on a personal level they do help people be again more community minded or just be okay with less material things which I think society desperately needs so I think it's really cool how we're being forced to be a bit more you know, responsible about how we live. And with that, that's all. Thanks so much for joining us today, guys. Thank you. Cool. Okay, great. Any last questions before we uh, continue our evenings? We had a lot of questions there. You guys were great. Well, again, that was awesome. We really appreciate everyone. Um, the support is, is, is key for us. And this, we got great content and we got uh, a whole presentation deck now that we would love to get feedback on maybe afterwards on maybe topics you think we should cover more of, cover less of, because uh, there's just so much to cover. So we're going to be uh, building our content library and, you know, presenting in front of more people that I hopefully can get educated more and make better financial decisions at the end of the day, right? I know it's intimidating to uh, buy real estate or, you know, finance it, but, um, you know, if you're smart with it and you're informed, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. So those are my kind of closing thoughts. Carson, any closing thoughts for the, the audience? Um, nope. Uh, that's, I think you wrapped it up. So. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Ooh.